Before we dig into the details of Ephesians 2, 1 to 11, I wanted to just give you the big picture. I can't get it all on one screen, so we'll use two screens. And as I walk through it, I'll try to just show you how the big pieces fit together and link in with what we've seen before. And then when we begin to dig into the details, you'll be able to fit them into the big picture. That's my way of thinking about how the pieces fit together with the larger structure. So, Father, grant that we would see, even though there are many detailed questions we don't have answers for yet, show us the big picture here so that things will begin to make sense more clearly in relation to the whole. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You were dead in the trespasses and sins. You here, distinguished from the we here, so Gentiles, and then the Jews get included. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins, in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the age of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So that's a description of the condition of the Gentile Christians that he's writing to before they were converted, before verse 5 happened to them when they were made alive. Let's keep going. Among whom, these sons of disobedience, among those sons of disobedience, we all, so that's Jews now included, we all once conducted ourselves in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Okay, so that's pretty clear that Paul is now, including himself and all the Jewish Christians, in with the Gentiles and saying, uh, once, so we'll put here, Gentiles were cut off from Christ in their spiritual deadness, and we too, Jews included. Same condition. And what was the condition? Let's just focus on them for a moment. You were dead, trespasses and sins. You were walking right in lockstep with the spirit of the age according to the age of this world, and that was in lockstep with the prince of the power of the air, Satan, that's now at work in the sons of disobedience. So you, your DNA was disobedience. Disobedience was your, your family lineage. And same with us. We all once conducted ourselves in the passions of the flesh. So just like you were in sync with the world, we were in sync with the flesh. We were carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, just like you were in sync with the power of the air. We were in sync with the body and the mind cut off from Christ. And we're by nature, which is very much like sons of disobedience, by nature, children of wrath. So the big summary here is dead. Dead. Horrible, horrible bleakness, blindness, deadness, under wrath, by nature disobeying, spiritually dead, in the, in the power of, the, of, of Satan. Now, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive. That's us. That's you. Made all of us Christians alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. He inserts that in to make sure we understand the nature of grace as something that isn't merited because we're dead. He made us alive by grace. That's the only way you can have life, grace. And raised us up with Christ and seated us. 
So we're not only alive, we're so united to Christ that we're with him now in his resurrection and with him at the right hand of God as secure as one can possibly be with him in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. New life from God by mighty grace. And what was the ultimate goal of it all? So that in the coming ages he might show, display, lavish, wave a flag the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Ultimate goal of new life in Christ. Show grace and its riches. Sound familiar? From 1, 6, 12, 14? Let's keep going. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not a result of works. So he's summing up there what he said already, namely that we were made alive, made alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And if we were dead and made alive by grace, clearly it is the gift of God. It is not a result of our works. It is a gift. And thus faith and grace are free works and gifts of God. And then comes Again, the ultimate purpose stated negatively, so that no one may boast, that is, boast in their own works, boast in their own life that enabled them to choose Christ. Keep going. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So there's a ground, a ground, a basis, an argument for why no one can boast. Because all our new works as Christians are gifts. They are God's creation. We are his workmanship. We are created. He prepared the works beforehand. We'll have lots more to say about this when we get here, but that's the initial comment. All of our works are gifts, are God's creation. That's a foundation for therefore no one can boast which is also founded in the fact that we're saved by grace. It's not according to works. And so here's the, here's the big picture. He begins with telling us our dreadful condition as Jew and Gentile. Everybody, the rest of mankind, are dead in trespasses and sins. And then he unfolds the nature of that deadness. God steps in with sovereign grace and raises dead people from the dead, and seats us with Christ in the heavenly places, making us secure for eternity with him. Why is he doing it this way with grace? Answer, to show, to show off, to display, to wave the banner of the immeasurable riches of his grace which negatively is stated, nobody can boast. It is all, all of grace. And everything is designed to show the riches of his grace. And we end by simply reminding ourselves that in chapter 1, verse 6, all of salvation was unto the praise of the glory, the glory of his grace. Chapter 1, verse 12, unto the praise of his glory. 
chapter 1, verse 14, under the praise of his glory. And Paul is still bent on doing everything he can to help us see that our salvation, both in its eternal preparations in chapter 1 and its practical, immediate 21st century applications in our conversion, is all intended to display the matchless grace of God, the sovereign grace of God, and to shut the mouth of all human boasting.